Good morning, my name is David Grinspoon. Oh, and are you a life form? I do think of myself as a life form, yes. How do you know that? Uh, how do I know I'm a life form? Yeah. Well, um, we could get very uh, philosophical and uh, Cartesian here and ask how one knows anything. Um, but uh, I suppose uh, the way I categorize things and the way I look around uh, the universe and, and the, my immediate environment, I have uh, things in common with other things that seem to me like life forms. And uh, so that's, I've never really questioned whether I'm a life form or not. <laughs> well, let's, let, can you show us the rock? What, your, yeah. Show us a rock. Yeah. So this is, so this let's is compare kind you of a, to a rock. rock. There's a yeah. rock. Hold it up closer, please. No, yeah. no, 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 do your face here. Okay. That's a rock and this, there's you. This is a and, rock and this and is me. And what's the difference between those two? Difference between these, uh, well, there are a lot of differences, but I guess the relevant difference to why I consider myself a life form and this rock not a life form is uh has to do with how we interact with the rest of the world this rock is pretty much static and stable it's not really on the time scales that i'm aware of certainly with my senses doing anything but but you're moving faster than the plant can you show us the plant next yeah to you? the plant is and this on a different time scale this too, plant right? is fairly static that's true and yet actually this particular plant uh my wife and I have nurtured from, it was really almost dead when we put really? it in this pot. So, it was um, a different color and almost had no leaves. And we gave it water and made sure it had enough light. And it's, uh, we've actually seen it behave in a way that I would not expect this rock to behave. So it is interacting with the world, exchan apparently exchanging matter because it's gotten bigger uh, and but changed that's a time its shape. Of a year or two, but what if you yeah. looked at a rock for a billion years? Right, right. So over over a long period of time, um, this rock, or probably not just it, but the it, the world it was connected to, if I go back and, th and look at its history, um, it would have behaved in ways that perhaps did seem more to me um, it would 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 be fit more in the, that category of how I'm describing the properties of living systems interacting with their their surroundings and so forth. And but surely so, it's not a, just a question of time. So that but yeah, but it's not just a question of also being static or changing, because uh, there's also the the way in which I'm interchanging ma this plant and I, my friend the plant and I, the way in which we're exchanging matter with our environments in a specific way and um what do you mean specific way rock's doing it in a specific way too yeah right right exactly so but but the details of how a life form and a rock are doing that are different um there are processes going on with these living with we living organisms where um we are uh eating and excreting and exchanging um, energy in a specific way with our environment, e e eating certain kinds of chemicals, extracting energy from them, which is allowing us to to grow and move and have energy and do things, and then uh, excre excreting other chemicals in a, in, in a different energy state. But so isn't, that's... But isn't that rock absorbing some elements and then giving off other elements and then... Uh... Yeah, it, absolu it absolutely is. And in fact, if you look at this rock as a part of a larger system, which of course ultimately it is, the reason why it's so beautiful when I picked it up on the beach there is because it's been through a lot and it's had an interesting story where it obviously, from the layered structure, it looks like it's some kind of sedimentary rock and was records some era of time when the layers were getting uh, deposited in place on the earth and then, then um, uh, compressed under pressure and then you know turned it into a rock and then obviously it's been tossed around in the ocean and but you're using and, past tense um, here and yes but yeah but if you could use present tense if you just extend the now to a billion years right right so 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 this rock in fact is participating in all kinds of interesting cyclic processes on the earth which it is true if we look at them in some kind of billion year time lapse do take on more of the properties of, uh, I think, of a living organism. This is, of course, you know, getting into Gaia territory. Um, I don't know if you want me to just... <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, yeah. but, but I'm interested in the idea that the word life 
has associated with it time scales that we're comfortable with and spatial sizes that we're comfortable with. And then and it, to refer to life as something really, really big like the universe or a galaxy or the earth or to a molecule, that becomes harder to do. And similarly, to talk about something that moves and changes on a time scale of a billion years rather than a couple of seconds is also hard to do. Yeah. So it seems to me that as a physicist, you know, we don't like definitions that are so correlated with the size scale of the, of the observer. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I would want to uh, preface this conversation or, 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 or put in a caveat to this conversation that these questions of definition and boundaries of life are very squishy and not um, that easy to nail down in a uh, precise way. Uh, Is that which, a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it's, it's a very interesting thing. I think it's what makes this question so interesting. I mean, we could talk about some other question of definition, you know, what is a planet? And, you know, people argue about that, but fundamentally that's boring. That's really just nomenclature and we need a convenient uh, story to say Pluto's a planet or it's not. But it doesn't really get into some profound question of planethood and how planethood operates in the universe or whatever. But asking whether something is alive and what is the difference actually does get us into profound territory because we realize that we don't actually know. Uh, and we, in my opinion, aren't capable of knowing right now because we do have only this one living system, um, the Earth system to to look at. And we have ideas about how we might universalize that, but we haven't actually, you, you know, with, with one, essentially we've made one observation. And for science, that's not really a good basis of drawing universal uh, uh, conclusions. But I think I think Feynman once said that if you have an, a, a, a result and it's kind of like oh one sigma result or something, and then you look more and more carefully, and if you look more and more carefully, your signal to noise doesn't go up. If it doesn't become more well defined, then you're probably using a concept and assumption that's not valid. So I'm wondering if the same thing could be held about life because if you look more and more carefully, inside of, well that doesn't make any more sense than before. And right, so, right. If, and maybe we ought to just give up on it, like sometimes some of us give up on the idea of soul or an angel or a god or something. That if you look really carefully and the evidence for it disappears, then say, hey, it's not a useful concept. We should try to yeah. think of something else. Well, or, or I think of it as, you know, that we can, we can make these distinctions that are um, sort of locally useful. Like, I think I can draw a meaningful distinction between an organism and a rock which is useful, say we're a scientist in the field and we're looking for things and we want to go, oh, is that, you know, is that a fossil of a, of a living organism or is that just something that was, um, you know, some rock that was sort of shaped like a living organism and is fooling us? I think those distinctions are still useful, but they're not universally, like if you really push at them and then say, wait, what do you mean that rock if you think about it on billions of years? And I have to admit, yes, when you really push me on that, I... Um, and some scientists will differ on this, but personally, I am a big fan of, say, the Gaia hypothesis. And I, I actually do think that in a certain valid sense, the Earth is, the planet itself is a kind of living organism, a, diff a different kind of living organism than I am. But then if in from that context, is this rock alive? Well, so is a piece of an organism, is a piece of a living thing also alive? I well, mean, that's a unit of living thing. Right, if, right. If, for example, let's call it the solar system. I'm an astronomer. I'm familiar with the sun and the galaxy. So I said, oh, they're, they're living organisms. And so is that useful to extend this concept, which starts to, well, let me ask you another question. When you study evolution, eyeballs or brains, and you look back, where did they come from? As you look further and further back, they start to get deconstructed. They were proto and proto, 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 and proto, proto. Now, could we say the same thing about life and say, hey, there was proto life and then proto, proto life. And that's what we should expect. And therefore to put a definition on an eyeball is to kind of like an anachronism associated with our present moment. Well, it's, it, it's like talking about nation states uh, 10,000 years ago. There yeah. are no such thing as nation so, states. So I think there's, you know, any definition we have will come across these, these boundaries we talked about the boundaries of scale. There's also the boundaries of going back in time and I mean looking. Dimensions. You don't mean boundaries, do you? Yeah. Well, uh, places. What I'm. I mean. I mean. I don't mean boundaries in the physical boundary. I mean places where the the definition sort of fails us, or we get into territory where it doesn't make sense anymore. So we talked about physical scale. You, you, now you mentioned uh, going back in time, and yeah, you can look evolution in terms of evolution. At what point did you go from uh, non-life 
to life. And then there's, then there's a physical scale getting smaller. I, I believe I'm a living organism. My I'm made up of individual cells, each of which seem very much like living organisms in a certain sense. They're made up of molecules. You could make an argument for molecules being alive, certain molecules, I think. But molecules are made up of atoms. And I don't think you can make up a really good argument for atoms being alive unless you say that something that's part of something else alive is by definition alive. Mm -hmm. So, but, and, then, and then quarks and all that stuff that you know more about than me, uh, you know, that, those to me don't seem like, it doesn't seem fruitful to talk about those as living things to me. Now, could it be the fact, could it be the, in fact the case that as heterotrophs, we go around looking at things that we can eat and things we can't eat and anything we can eat, we say, hey, it was alive. And anything <laughs> we can't eat, we say, no, it's dead. Or it's not useful. So if we were plants and we had a brain, then we would say sunshine is alive and, uh, I don't know the, I guess, maybe the animals around us are not live because I can't use them. That's an interesting, that's an interesting point. For a, an intelligent plant, of which there surely must be some somewhere in the universe. Well, how do you know that one's not intelligent? You just insulted your friend here. In fact, that's a really good point. But the more I learn, the more we learn about uh, plants in in the wild and populations of trees and the way they actually do communicate with each other. And to me, you know, you just look at a root system and it reminds you of like a system of neurons in a brain. Mm -hmm. So I actually don't think we can rule out intelligent plants. Um, I don't know if plants on earth um, have gotten to the point where they have um, philosophy and um, thoughts about definitions of things. But I, again, I don't know, but I, I suspect they haven't, but I'm, I'm imagining somewhere in the universe there's there's a plant that actually uh, is, um, you know, maybe has much more sophisticated thoughts and maybe even technology than than we do. And it would be fascinating to uh, wonder, maybe even to sometime, to be able to ask them how they define things. And yeah, like like you said, maybe to them an animal is. Um, is not alive or is is some sort of second class kind of organism the way we often denigrate plants like you just heard me do <laughs> mm -hmm. or a gust of wind that passes and who cares yeah uh, how the gust of, the gust of wind is a really interesting actually you you just uh mentioned can i just go off on that for a second because when i look at um the images of mars we've been getting from our rovers and you look at that landscape and it seems mostly to me dead and then I see one of these dust devils come coursing across, and it looks it looks it really looks alive to me. If, if I were somebody who sort of believed in ghosts or animated spirits, and uh, you know, like like some people um, some people do or have, um, I, you kind of get the get, you understand that animistic view of the world where the wind and the trees and things all, you know, have spirits. Because when you see that dust devil coursing across the surface of Mars, it's like, oh, it's almost like, well, there's something alive. And it, it, that, that to me connects with another aspect of life that I think of, that another thing that differentiates us maybe from these rocks, at least uh, superficially, which is that uh, th this notion of dissipative systems, if, if I can, this notion of, of flows of energy that are animating things and that life is some kind of a vessel for that. And so even things that you might not strictly picture as alive from our normal scientific definitions, like, like a dust devil, have that quality. They seem to have an aliveness. And, and to me, that relates perhaps to this notion that while there is a dissipative system there, there is energy flowing and, and causing this temporary structure to, to have interesting organization and move in a certain way. And in a way, that's what I am and, and this plant is is uh, you know, some way in which a flow of energy has temporarily animated some matter to organize itself in some interesting way. So, uh, But is there a difference between, you're, you're using the two words, a flow of energy and then a dissipative system as if they were different. Aren't they the same thing? They, uh, they are the same thing, except, and again, I'm not a physicist um, or a thermodynamicist, but I've read what other people have said about this and thought right, about it a lot. Cool, for example, and, Schneider and yeah, Sagan. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it seems to me that not every flow of energy um, creates a dissipative system. It has to do with the uh, the rate of flow and some some other parameters. So there are conditions within which uh, flows of energy are um, channeled in mm -hmm. in the way that, that they self organize these these more complex structures. And other other flows of energy sort sort of don't seem to do it. Now you use the word self. 
So there's another word that I have a really big problem <laughs> with. And matter of fact, I've, I'm trying to avoid using the word self because I guess I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe in this word self anymore because I see so many people say, oh, it's self-organizing. It's like, well, wait a minute. The organization came from the gradient that was set up by an environment and that the mm -hmm. environment is usually strictly not thought of as the self. Yeah. But when that environment sets up these conditions, then we say, oh, it's self-organized. It's kind of like saying, hey, I eat, 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 and then I say, I got fat by myself. Or somebody puts in, yeah. it, it doesn't seem to make well, sense. Well, self is sense? I know in your book, you use the word self about, uh, hold your book up, by the way. Oh, Lonely yeah. Lonely Planet, there it My is. My book, Lonely well, Planet. <laughs> and in the book, there, you use the word self probably maybe 200 times. Mm -hmm. And every time I read the word self, I didn't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So could you be trying yeah. to help me out with that? Yeah. So self is one of those words, um, you're, you're zooming in on all the interesting and hard um, definitional questions here. Self is one of those words like life that to me is, is useful, but kind of indefensible in that when you really look at it and probe question, probe, you realize that uh, that it almost kind of dissipates the meaning. So I obviously, would, I would say almost, I would say it absolutely dissipates. Yeah. Well, would you agree with that or not? Um, but I guess you wouldn't because you used it so many times. No, I wouldn't say absolutely, but I would say, you know, it's it, like life. I would say that it's it's useful but not strictly defensible. Uh, so I mean, an obvious example is I I think of myself <laughs> as a self. Um, I um, move through the world, I interact with other people and other things, and I um, feel a kind of an integrity. It's a very powerful illusion, isn't it? Yes. But yet I know, um, and some of this I know from direct experience, but mostly I know from you know reading journal articles and pop science and stuff, I know that that is an illusion because, uh, especially recently what we've learned about the microbiome and the fact that most of my cells are not even my cells uh, that I was born, that come from the DNA from my parents. They're, they're, I'm exchanging matter and cell, living cells with the environment all the time. And the atoms of which I am composed are coming into me and leaving me. And, and uh, so what is that self? It's uh, to the best I could um, describe it, it's a pattern of organization. Like a hurricane. Uh, yes. So like, a hurricane does a cell thing? Ah, uh, well, yeah. No, that's, that's a great question. You know, is uh, I would say a hurricane, uh, d does a self require being self-aware? To me, I would guess a hurricane is not self-aware, and I feel as though human beings are, but you know, again, this is one of these indefensible things where you could ask me a million questions and make me go, oh, well, you're right. I'll, 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 I'll ask you about, uh, about self-awareness in a little bit. Yeah. But how about the, this idea of self-reproduction? It's often invoked to describe life. And I, when I teach my course, I say to my students, you can't self-reproduce, nothing self-reproduce. I take you a healthy female and a healthy male, put you in a hermetically sealed capsule in outer space, you will die, you will not self-reproduce. I say, any living organism is obligatorily embedded in an environment without which you can't do anything and that takes away this independence of the self. That's Do you disagree with that? Or? No, that's absolutely true. In fact, um, in one of my uh, sort of what of life, what is life talks, um, I do, I get into some of these borderline questions and I, and I talk about the fact that people argue over whether viruses are alive because they say, well, virus can't be alive because it's completely dependent on these other cells for its metabolism. It just hijacks their metabolism. But then if you're saying, okay, a, a, a possible organism is not really alive if it's completely dependent on a larger living system or a larger physical system for its existence, then you would have to say, well, a human being is not alive either. Except that no life is alive. Because we are completely dependent. Put a human being out on the moon all by themselves, mm. they're going to do as well as that virus without a cell. Or that tree or the... <laughs> yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, there, there is a an interdependence on larger systems that is inherently part of life and that would mess with any strict notion we try to come up with of, of the self. I, I, I can't argue with that. Okay, well let's talk about self-awareness then. And uh, you have, can you, you had some experience with Carl Sagan. Mm -hmm. And I think I became a, a cosmologist and then an astrobiologist because I read this book, Cosmic Connection, when I was in high school or something. And I said, oh, this is great stuff, I gotta do this. And I guess maybe you were in that, did that too. So tell us, that, now in your book you talk about uh, Carl Sagan's view and your view and many other people's view that humans are a way for the universe to become aware of itself. Could you tell us a little bit about that idea? 
and the, what are the details? What's the evidence for it? And well, I I do think it's really kind of remarkable that there are these bits of the Earth which are somehow animated, which are observing the rest of the universe and trying to make sense of it. And now, even, when you say bits of the universe, you mean homo sapiens? Well, the current... Or do you mean the, things that have passed the mirror test, or what do you mean? I think the current local example is homo sapiens. Okay. And I realize that current local example, that phrase implies uh, non-current, non-local examples, which <laughs> raises a lot of questions. But, I, but, but yes, I'm, I am talking about human beings, but... Are, but human beings surely are not equally self-aware. Some human beings do not lead, lead an examined life, and therefore their life is not self-aware no, and not and worth some, living. Some people are in a coma because they got hit by a truck, and some people are... Um, yeah, no. But some people don't want to look in the mirror, don't want to think about their own mortality, and they don't really have a sense of who they are, and, but they go to work, they're perfectly functioning human beings, but they don't have this quality of self-awareness or even what, or heightened self-awareness. And so if self-awareness is so good, then I would have thought, oh, this person really has a sense of self, and this one doesn't, therefore, this person's more sentient, therefore, hey, they should vote, and these people should not vote. And so we get an anti-democratic, Ayn huh. Rand type of thing going on. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I suppose you could go, go that route and think of a differentiation between people um, and argue whether some are more self-aware and some less self-aware. You self -aware. would? That's not self-apparent to you? <laughs> well, I suppose it is, but I'm, I'm thinking, if you look at this phenomenon of um, look at life on Earth um, 100 million years ago, there were a lot of interesting species doing a lot of interesting things um, and probably a lot that we don't really know about and just surmise from the scant evidence we have. Um, and look at Earth now and there are these um, little bits of the planet flying off into space and flying over to other planets and sending radio signals back to the planet and, and um, these interconnected webs of energy and information and um, these, uh, this um, activity of um, trying to piece together the history of the universe and the uh, structure and, and, and um, nature of the rest of the universe. Not that we've got it right at all, but there are just that activity that there's, there are part, there's um, something on Earth going on where this is, that, that's, that's new, that wasn't happening 100 million years ago. And uh, I think there's a way you can try to describe that where you're not being self-aggrandizing and saying, well, this is the epitome of, uh, like the universe has finally woken up and here we are, we're so great. Uh, I mean, there's a, I think there's a danger in phrasing things that sound like that. But to me, that I think there's a way we could try to sort of describe that phenomena and acknowledge that it's different from whatever phenomena were happening on Earth 100 million years ago, and, and sort of try to abstract and say, well, so what is this? What's going on? And, and could that be happening somewhere else in the universe? Well, um, could you tell us a little bit about cosmism? Yeah. So cosmism um, is an idea that I discovered when I was uh, doing some reading, actually, uh, for for uh, this book, Lonely Planets, um, you know, a little more than a decade ago, um, that was held by a number of, uh, the Russian cosmists were a group of uh, young philosophers in um, around the turn of the last century, the early uh, 20th century, um, in what became the Soviet Union, but wasn't yet when they were doing this work. And they developed this, this theory in which they saw uh, human existence as part of a long-term evolution of the earth and perhaps of the whole universe from um, uh, to towards awareness, self-awareness and towards... Towards self-awareness, so an evolutionary direction. Now that influenced yeah. Carl Sagan and Carl Sagan influenced you, so you, I think in your book you described your more natural philosophy as cosmic, a cosmism or something. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, I mean, 
I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of a grazer when it comes to philosophies. I don't I'm not a, not a joiner, but I'm an admirer, uh, and I'm I'm a very much an admirer of the the cosmists, which doesn't mean to say that I embrace everything they ever did and said. But what resonated what resonates with me is that they saw um, they they merged our our emerging scientific understanding of life and of um, human evolution and so forth with a view of um, cosmic evolution of, of uh, you know the different stages the universe goes through and tried to understand how we were embedded within that process and they also I have to admit part of what appealed to me was there was a spiritual component of what they did um, it was an interesting blend of kind of Eastern and Western religion where um, they left out the stuff that to me doesn't make that much sense, like specific gods directing specific things, but um, the aspects of um, seeing uh, ourselves as part of something much larger than ourselves and some unfolding of some process that's only partially known to us. And there was a very idealistic kind of utopian future aspect of this, which um, where they saw that they imagined uh, certainly Tsiolkovsky, who is my, my favorite cosmist, but not, not the only one, imagined this happening elsewhere in the universe and that some far future time um, that our enlightened descendants would meet the enlightened descendants of uh, the, the unfolding of intelligence on other worlds and that there would ultimately be this, this merging of uh, intelli intelligent uh, universe and some, some enlightened uh, self-aware state of, of the universe. and. Um, you know, I, I can't say literally this is what I think will happen. It's not so much um, a prediction of the future as a um, a vision that that I like that doesn't seem incompatible with what I think I know about the universe. Well, I would I would say that it, it does seem incompatible with what I think I know about it. For and it, it put for the problem that I have with it is it puts human beings front and center in a, a species specific characteristic of which we assess ourselves to be the best member of. That means the self aware group, and as the goal of evolution, and that just grabs my brain and says, and I and I can't go there. And so, uh, you know, I love Carl Sagan and all his stuff, but I I am not a I consider him to be a brain worshiper, and I consider you and a lot of other people to be a brain worshiper in the sense that when you put our species specific, we're the best at what? Self-awareness as the goal that's unifying as, and life anywhere is converging or evolving to that. That sounds, that sounds so much like self-serving aggrandizement. You're no longer a part of the universe. You are the goal of the universe. Well, and that uh, let, me, of, let me respond to that. I think that we have to be very wary of um, sort of selection issues. That here we are observing the universe and trying to make sense of it, and um, any conclusion that we are special is very suspect. But um, I, I also see the possibility of um, of an opposite kind of selection, which I, I I would say you might be a little bit guilty of, which is um, rejecting um, in um, in an ad hoc way any picture in which we play a special role. Now, what if it was true that we did play a special role and then somebody came along and said, oh no, that is, um, is inherently a false way of looking at things uh, because, because I suspect it, because it's putting us on a pedestal. And I, I feel like we could go, go in that direction too and, and make an error. And that's why, um, but, but I mean, I, 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 I don't mean to discount your, Critique. I think it's. I think we need to pay attention to it, and it's it's valid. But again, that's why I try to back off and say, okay, well, let's let's remove. Um, let's try not to be self-aggrandizing about this. Let's look at what the Earth is doing now that it wasn't doing a hundred million years ago. And if you were an alien coming to our planet, you'd say, oh, look at these lights and these networks and these spacecraft shooting off and these these telescopes and this. There, there's some there's something going on here, and and curiosity and um, and an attempt to assimilate information and tell a story about the universe uh, is part part of that, and it's very unusual. I actually don't. Do you have an unusualometer 
For example, I would say <laughs> I would say that the you know the giraffe is you know I'm a giraffe and you're a giraffe and giraffes are the way for the universe to become a giraffe and and I said well that's kind of silly they're not as special as we are because uh, because of the things you just described and but the giraffe point of view well, wait a minute I'm so tall I'm the tallest one around I can eat the top of the acacia tree no one else can do that so if a visitor of a an advanced giraffe came to our planet and looked and said, oh, which one is filling the giraffe niche here? Oh, it's you. You're special. So I, I, okay. how can you quantify okay, but the here's, specialness? Uh, very, good, very good point. But, but, but here's what I would say to that. An advanced giraffe couldn't come to our planet just by having a long neck. neck you can have the longest neck in the world that won't get you to another planet. What would it be that would allow that advanced giraffe to come to our planet and so, make observations, and so I think that, are better that because they can go. To, they've already gone all over the universe and traveled to other planets, and we haven't. So we're kind of like the giraffe with respect to a, a world-traveling bacterium. And so uh, I'm, I'm reversing the argument for you. For you. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but but just before you reverse it, so I th I think that there is something in that if you posit an advanced giraffe coming and studying us with science and, and, and noticing um, the differences. Well, forget between... about a giraffe, an advanced giraffe. Just say, well, hey, I'm a giraffe and I'm special. And advanced... the universe is going, trying to evolve, become a giraffe. Okay, forget about the advanced giraffe. Yeah, but even, even having that thought. Well, that's because I'm a human being. I've been, I know, I've been bombarded with the word advanced. The, the, no, but the ability to compare and think about the rest of the universe and uh, I mean, we we wouldn't be aware of these patterns and uh, everything we're talking about without having science. I and know, but if we had a dog in here, the dog would be aware of all of the odors in here, billions of things that yeah. we are completely yeah. ignorant of, and we could say, okay, that dog is more sentient, yeah. therefore no, it's so more I mean, advanced or something. So clearly there are things that dogs are better at and uh, more highly evolved at, and giraffes. Well, and, and But every species is unique. Every species Humans are unique, unique, just like every other species. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's a kind of a democratic way of, of yeah. formulating the specialness, and therefore yeah. it kind of undoes the, hey, this is the goal of evolution. To well, our I, particular. Don't, I don't think it's the goal of evolution. In fact, I um, would say that we have not, that my view of human beings is that we are not an intelligent species, and that um, if there is intelligent, really intelligent life out there, then it's... Um, it's at some stage that would not regard us really as intelligence and would be interested in us perhaps and perhaps not, but would not see us as one of them. So um, we have to do work on our morality and in-group thinking and, uh, before they will uh, accept our application to the Galactic Club. Well, one could come up with a basic criterion, which is that um, if one is going to have a technological civilization, um, don't kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, have the basic qualities that would allow it to have some kind of longevity and not just be some flash in the pan. And, and we are clearly not at any kind of stage where we can say that we have that kind of continuity quality. So, um, so the flip side of this, uh, saying that, that by calling us self-aware and saying there's something unique about that and, and saying that I'm, you know, seeing us as the apotheosis, actually in my cosmist worldview or whatever it is, my own worldview that's influenced by the cosmists and the Saganists and other people. Uh, I, and this is actually, I think, a place where I differ from, from Sagan, um, much as I ad admire it and miss him. I do think that he did tend to worship the human brain and put us on some kind of a pedestal and say, oh, look how wonderful we are. Whereas, in my view, we're a glimmer of something that could be, and that our um, aspirations about, you know, if, if technological intelligence is something that is to play some interesting role in the universe, it would be something very different from what we are and what we've achieved up to this point. But, but isn't every species a glimmer of what could be? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Question. Are we alone? No, we're not alone. You're here and I'm here. We're talking to each other. Okay. Um, if you were in this room by yourself, <laughs> would you be alone? <laughs> yeah, if I was in this room by myself, I would be alone in a different sense. No, um, you'd have this plant next to you. Uh, yeah, my, my buddy, Planty. <laughs> Does it have a name? Point, poinsettia is actually, this is, this is a, this is a, 
a poinsettia. And actually, this is an experiment because these are these plants that everybody gets at Christmas every year, yes, and then you yes, just yes. let them die because you oh. think that that's what you're supposed to do. But then a friend told us recently, showed us this massive plant in his house, and he says, this is what happens if you actually keep one of these things alive for years and years. And All we right. thought, oh, we can keep this thing alive for years and years. We never knew that. So this is our, this is an experiment now. All right. All right. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm never alone with my plant. But uh, well, are we alone? Are we alone? First of all, what do you, when you hear that word, what do you think of we? What does we mean? Well, because we're having a conversation about astrobiology here, and I think I, you know, I, if, if I was meeting someone on the street who didn't know I was an astrobiologist and there was no context, and, and they said, hey, do you think we're alone? Yeah. I might respond to that question and go, um, well, yeah, there's nobody else around. So nobody else. So when you say that, when you say that, if there's a tree next door, you would still say we're alone yeah. because yeah. you're only referring to yes. the group of human yeah. beings. Yeah. So, so this question, though, are we alone in an astrobiological context, does does have layers, and does it? Or, or I thought you're only referring to human beings and well, other equally self-aware critters. Well, no. Uh, it, I'm, I'm saying it as layers because you can say so. If we discover microbes on Mars, and nothing else then have we answered the question, are we no longer alone in the universe? Mm -hmm. um, well, what's, the, what's your answer? My answer is we're still alone. Still alone. Because? I, I want to find microbes on Mars or elsewhere. I think it will be really exciting and really useful and really fruitful. It will help us understand who we are and what we are, but it won't make me feel like we're not alone. What would make me feel like we're not alone in this sense is some other species out there that is thinking and uh, attempting to communicate and um, po the, uh, the possibility of exchanging information and perspective. Uh, even if they were like really non-communicative and had no interest in, uh, even that, the, the, some, some, other, some other beings out there that were, that we're thinking and communicating um, and uh, doing some of these things that, that seem to differentiate human beings from other life. So you're looking Earth. for other human beings. Until we find other human beings elsewhere in the universe, we will be alone. Well, I'm sure they won't be other human beings. That's well, you, one said, you just listed a whole bunch of qualities yeah. which are right. essentially species-specific to yeah. human beings on yeah. this planet, and right. then you're saying they wouldn't be human beings. So I see no, a kind absolutely of, a they kind of problem there. So, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the possibility that there are other creatures that, that share some of these qualities. Well, well, I'm interested in other Charlie line weavers in the universe, and I'm going to be alone until I find one. Isn't that well, then you're, gonna stupid, be alone, that thing, then you're going to be alone forever. Who said, no, well, I can say the same thing to you about looking for other yeah. human beings, right? Well, so you're going to be alone forever. If I were, no, there's no other species. If I were looking for other human beings, I would agree with that. But I think, okay, so... so you listed is, a whole bunch of qualities that are human being specific. So how do you then say it's, I'm not looking yeah, for other Yeah, but how is that any different from like when we're looking for microbes on Mars and looking for other uh, qualities that are... are, are, are um, life specific. Life specific. Yes, 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 yes. So in some ways, we're al always looking for projections of ourselves out there. Mm -hmm. um, and but just as there are reasonable arguments that suggest we could find microbes elsewhere because there are evolutionary processes that seem like they could produce microbes, even though they wouldn't be exactly the same as the ones here. I would argue the same is true for some of these qualities that human beings have. You'd argue, what's the evidence for that argument? Well, um, the evidence, you know, it's, there, there isn't really any. <laughs> I would but, say the evidence is your vanity. How about that? And you well, would not plead guilty to that, would you? No, I wouldn't. To so defend yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, I would say that there's um, a good argument to be made that cognitive systems are um, something that could evolve elsewhere. I mean, now we're assuming there, that, that cells and life forms have evolved elsewhere, and we could, you know, you could, we could argue about that for hours. But let's just assume we've agreed that that's possible. Yeah. Um, and then you have evolving um, biospheres with interacting um, groups of species, finding survival niches, and getting one up on the other so they can survive and find something to eat. And 
So you're invoking evolution as a universal process. Yeah, yeah, I, I very much so. I, it seems to me evolution ought to be a universal process once you get replication, once you get things making copies of themselves, then some are going to make better copies than others, and then you've got evolution. Are they making copies? Do you need making copies of themselves or just making copies? Making copies. Got, uh, well, <laughs> selves. Okay, yeah. Anyways, things, things, replication. You've got replication, and once you've got replication, I think you've got evolution. And once you've got evolution, then a lot of interesting things can happen. And some of those things on other worlds can be expected to uh, be the same as some of those things here. And which ones? Uh, we've seen, there are a lot of examples of what is called convergent evolution. Uh, you know, the shapes of swimming fishes and dolphins and the wings of bats and birds and insects. Yeah, all that. There, there are... So you read Simon Conway Morris's books on this. And yeah, like the king yeah. of the Bible of convergence. Yeah. yeah, and I don't necessarily go as far as uh, somebody like uh, Morris or uh, Deduve who like, you know, thinks that everything's going to be exactly the same everywhere in the universe. But I do, I, I think that evidence for convergent evolution strengthens the notion that some of the same innovations would be found by evolution on other planets because they work in a wide range of uh, of they, situations. They work or because they've been multiple, evolved, evolved multiple times independently? Well, um... Because you have some, like English is working between us, we're communicating, but you wouldn't think of that as convergent, not, so it, although it no. works, yeah. it's not convergent because no. English hasn't evolved independently. No, so no, that's right, that's right. Uh, but I, I think it, the, the notion of convergence to me implies uh, multiple independent origins that, that uh, were successful in different situations. So your best example of um, that is? Um, well, you know, that, I, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, so I use the examples that people mm -hmm. use in books like uh, the swimming shape of dolphins and, and, um, and, and fish, mm -hmm. which are a response to the same physical need to be aerodynamic or fluid dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, th th again, the, the, the wings of bats and birds and insects, you know, there are certain physical... It's, uh, flight is a good idea. Like any any um, planet with an atmosphere and animals, some something's going to figure out how to fly because it's a great way to get around. And um, the there are certain shapes of limbs that make that possible. I it would not shock me if even though I don't think aliens will look like they like Earth creatures, I wouldn't shock me to see an alien someday on some planet with wings that look sort of like wings, because that's a shape that works to fly through the air. Anyways, so, so getting to nervous systems, um, the, it's advantageous to, uh, for an organism to be able to sense its surroundings and respond in some ways, to have behavior, and that, that puts in a selection pressure um, to have, introduce a selection pressure to have uh, simple nervous system, some way to um, sense the environment and um, communicate that, um, that information to some central node that determines behavior. And then you've got nervous systems, and then nervous systems are competing and getting more, um, more uh, efficient and sophisticated. So I see that as something that that could happen elsewhere. I mean, we don't know any of this. This is why we want to explore as opposed to just, um, you know, sitting here in my kitchen and talking. It's, you know, we're going we're gonna to learn the answers by going out there and looking. But, but I think one can make a credible argument for nervous systems and the evolution of more sophisticated nervous systems being uh, selected for. And then once you get to that point, um, then it's an interesting question whether some of these other things uh, you know, like language and what, what uh, Sagan called, um, uh, he probably wasn't the first, but I, um, I was influenced by his talking about extrasomatic information storage outside of the body books and language and um, oral histories and all that. Then you have communicating groups of organisms collectively solving problems. Like bacterial communities. Yes, like bacterial communities or like uh, groups of um, human beings or um, meerkats or, um, you know, yeah, certainly social behavior is not unique to human beings. Um, like a stellar nursery of stars? Maybe, maybe. That's, you're getting a little cosmist on me there. Okay, um. <laughs> okay. now this question, are we alone? Is it an important question? Why should we uh, care about this? Ah. Uh, well... 
I mean, what makes anything important is, is that you just asked me a value question. What mm -hmm. is it important? Why should we care? So that's obviously not a science question. It's a value question. It, it, it matters uh, for how we do science and what we put our resources and our efforts into. But I would say we kind of can't help caring. Um, well, you and I can't help caring, but lots of people can help caring. Well, I wonder. I mean, I, I, you could find somebody who says, I don't give a hoot about that. You probably find a lot of people. A lot of people. But, <laughs> Most people, I think. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, there's 7 billion people on this planet, and most of them I don't know, but, but I have, and I know you have too, gone and talked to kids in lots of different situations and talked to the general public in museums, and yeah, that's self-selected for people. But it seems as though, to me, this question is one that sparks, that there is widespread, you can't say anything's universal, but there's widespread interest. And to me, it harkens back to um, the, even pre-scientific times, people were always fascinated with the question of whether there were other creatures that were sort of human-like and whether there were fairies and sprites out in the woods and, um, or gods or... Um, I feel like there's sort of this innate um, curiosity about other creatures and about other creatures that might be sort of like us but not quite like us. Um, but in my family, I'm the family genealogist and I care about my great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents and I'm fascinated by all this information about where I came from. My wife says, genealogy, you're just wasting your life. Live in the moment. Be now, because that's all you're going to get. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. It's so interesting to know about this history. And so similarly, there are lots of people who think, oh, I'm saying, oh look at this. Oh, the scientific version of Genesis is amazing. I understand how I got here. And they say, who cares how you got here? Go out and have a good time. Go have sex and dance or whatever. Yeah. And so there is this pull in very, two different directions. And the people like you and, and I who are interested in this uh, uh, are we alone scientific genesis thing, I would not say we're in, it's kind of yeah. like genealogy. There's a lot everywhere, but I think the minority of people are interested in their great grandparents. Yeah, well, so, I, you know, I, I, let me back off and say, I, 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 my point isn't really to make a claim for a sort of universal uh, human interest in this question. I would say widespread because I think it taps into something that seems innate, but doesn't, maybe doesn't tap into it for every, obviously doesn't tap into it for everybody, but I think um, we this do plant, have. For example, this plant does not care where it no, comes from. No, 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 no. This so, plant. This is this is a human quality I'm talking about, and maybe it's not unique to humans. But I don't think this plant. Um, but is, is it helpful? I mean, is it helpful to know you're going to die? I mean, a lot of people spend a lot of effort. Now mm -hmm. we've got a big brain that we mm -hmm. know this. They're they're have a lot of effort to forget it and say, well, get rid of it. I don't want to know that. Yeah. I don't want to know I'm going to die. I'm be better off if I don't know. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could argue ignorance is bliss, and maybe it would be better not to know. But I would say that I personally can't help wanting to know um, how we fit in. Does that make you a better person? Does that make, make you nicer to your wife? No, it make doesn't you a better make employee. It doesn't make me nicer or um, more effective at things. It might, you know, if I have some insight, it might help me get a. A paper published which would you know help me keep the bills paid so in that way it might help my wife but and there's no there's no specific way in which it really makes me a better person it's um there's a uh drive that we have to satisfy curiosity about uh the universe and about ourselves um and we, you know there's one level in which we can't we i think we actually can't, people like us can't help it um maybe not everybody, but I think I think curiosity is an innately human uh, quality. But, and like but for some too. people, it's curious. Like cats it's, too, right? Yeah, yeah, cats absolutely. And and for for a lot of people, given their circumstances, is it's probably applied to much more practical things. Like, um, is there something for me to eat over here because I'm hungry? But there, you know, curiosity stems from solving problems right. that uh, that would help survival. You know, now I can I can make an argument why. Ultimately, it's good for us, for human beings, and maybe even for the biosphere, for us to learn more about the universe. Because wow. ultimately, it will. It, it, we are now in a stage on this planet, whether we like it or not, where we are calling some of the shots. We human beings are calling some of the shots of what happens on this planet. We are evolving its atmosphere inadvertently. We need to um, start taking so, a slightly so, more uh, active role in our... In so our, calling the shots, so you believe in free will then? 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe in free will, so anybody who says I'm controlling or calling the shots, yeah. I just say I have no idea what uh, just said. What yeah, just said. That, uh, that's. Uh, let me, let me defer that question for a second. We, we, we have a certain level of influence now on the planet that maybe we didn't ask for, but we're becoming aware of. And so understanding how planets work and how life interacts with planets is no longer just a matter of curiosity. I would maintain it's a matter of survival, not just for us, but for, for, some of, uh, for all the other species we're sort of dragging around with us in this experiment we're, we're conducting. So there's, there is a practical aspect of this, maybe not of you know, wondering what... Are we conducting it or is it being conducted? Ah. It's happening, and we're playing a role. Now, so whether everything playing a role? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so now we're jumping to, <laughs> jumping to free will. Uh, which, well, control is the word you use, yeah, so I'm trying to understand yeah. what that means since I don't have any idea what it means. Yeah. Um, I, I have a very strong opinion about free will. Do you? You didn't say anything about that in your book. No, because it doesn't <laughs> fit in there, and it's, it's very unsophisticated. I don't think I would write about it in a book. Oh, I, probably shouldn't, I, shouldn't, I probably shouldn't even talk about it here, because you'll just you'll highlight that quote and make me look like an idiot. Because it's not very sophisticated, but it's a strong opinion. It, just, it seems to me obvious that we have free will. I see. Right. I think everybody would agree with that. Um, that doesn't mean that it exists. No, it doesn't. And, and, and you know, against, against that... You could say, and, and I, I, love to, I love to make both sides of this argument, because I think it's an interesting, interesting argument. You could say, well, it seems to my neighbor over here obvious that there's a God that wants her to do something that I don't want her to do. Mm. And why isn't her apprehension of what is obvious you know, as valid as mine? So that's, you know, there's a problem with that. But I think that it's impossible for us to live our lives, even for one second, without actually believing that we have free will. Really? And uh, I mean, what would you, if you actually believe that you had no free will. Um, I feel that many times, for example, when I play soccer in the middle of a game of soccer, I'm chasing the ball as hard as I can. Why? I have, I have no, there's <laughs> no free will. It's absolutely, I'm on autopilot. I'm not deciding anything. It's like my body and my brain have taken over from me. I've just disengaged any volition and, and you just run. No, I mean, I, I, do have, I do have moments of that feeling with, that I'm not in control at all. And for me, it's not soccer, it's, uh, it's music is my main avenue to that. Uh -huh. And it's actually a really wonderful feeling. You feel uh -huh. like you're caught in some flow uh -huh. or you're, you're playing some, something, you're watching yourself it's do something. It's playing you. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and for me, the best moments of playing music with other people are those, those moments where you you're almost looking at yourself as almost out of body experience mm -hmm. where, where you're watching your fingers and, and hearing and going, oh, wow, listen to that. And it's not like I'm doing it. It's like I'm, it's happening. So I, I've had, I've definitely had that sensation, but I just think you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes. If you actually believe that you have no control over anything, why would you, what would you get out of bed in the morning? Why would you? Same thing as a dog gets out of bed, because you're hungry, because you're not tired anymore, but et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, but how about this? Um, let's change the subject a little bit. Free will is a really messy thing. Yeah, I, I was like, well, how, do okay. we get, how do we get into that? Can in, you just erase in, that part? <laughs> in 1995, Carl Sagan and Ernst Meyer had a debate, uh, and a written debate back and forth. I, I think you're familiar with this. And about for two or three pages, they're getting in two or three pages, and they essentially talking about whether I think functionally we should expect functionally equivalent humans out there. Right? I think Gigi, Gigi Simpson wrote, you know, the non prevalence of humanoids. Yeah. And so it's a little bit about like a biologist versus a physicist. And yeah. I've noticed that there seems to be a dichotomy of culture between physicists who I call the brain worshippers who are saying, oh yes, human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution. But I said, no, biology is one damn thing after another. There's no predictions like that. And you're crazy to think it converges on that. What do you think of that debate? What, uh, well, I think it's a, a really interesting debate, and I think you summarized it well. And there does seem to be this dichotomy between the um, astronomers and biologists, or physicists and biologists. Um, and it leads one to, you know, there's an interesting question. Of those two groups, who would be better equipped to um, predict the answer to this question elsewhere. Because on the one hand, biologists know how ev evolving systems work and physicists tend to reduce everything to simple 
trends and so forth. On the other hand, biologists are completely mired in this one example and are under the illusion that they're studying biodiversity and that they have all these different examples and can draw sweeping conclusions, but in fact, they have one example. So, so there's ways in which I think both, both uh, viewpoints, both sort of, set of sets of mental habits could um, pervert the thought, thought process and lead to a wrong answer. And again, this is why I think that... But when, all, you say, when you say one example, biologists have one example as a disadvantage, um, as a scientist, you have to say it's the only example we have. And right. to pretend that there are others doesn't seem to be that well-founded. You're kind of assuming mm. yeah. all, what we're trying to discuss. Right. When you say, oh, yeah. they only have one example, therefore they're Right, not. right, right. So, so there is the supposition that there, there could potentially be an ensemble of examples. And even that supposition... Well, there could also be angels all over the place. Yeah, right, and, you right. Know, right. No, I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying granted that I'm making that well, supposition. Well, the whole argument, argument is, no, you're not yeah. going to grant that. <laughs> well, uh, except, except a lot of people who make this argument um, accept the notion that there are probably other biospheres out there, other... Um, ensembles of organizing, uh, 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 of evolving uh, groups of organisms. They just... Uh, so Ernst Meyer was one of those guys, you think? I'm trying to remember. I, I think you're right about it. I think he thought that, oh, yes, you could have microbes yeah, out yeah, there, but yeah. you, you shouldn't expect... So the, so the most common form of this argument is like, oh, yeah, okay, there's probably, a, you know, yeah, the... the um, the argument from um, from plenitude. There's so many places that there's going to be. Yeah, okay. There's granted. There's going to be origins of life, and, but this particular quality that we're talking about that we have, um, if you look at evolution and the time scale, and it, you know this happened so recently here and was such a fluke that to even postulate it happening elsewhere, if you really look at the um, the record of um, of uh, terrestrial evolution. Is uh, it just doesn't make sense, and I know you you've made this kind of argument, um, and yeah, I, th I think it's an it's an interesting argument, and uh, you know nobody knows the answer. Uh, we'll we'll find this out by uh, hopefully ultimately by by exploring and either not finding anything after such a thorough search that we give up and say ah okay forget it. <laughs> Ernst Mayer may have been this cranky guy, but he was right. Or <laughs> or we'll we'll find something and that will change change the nature of the debate. But, but it does seem to me that there's more to this argument of expecting possible... And I don't like the, the, the functionally equivalent of humans. Yes, I uh, got it right there. Functionally equivalent humans. Carl it, Sagan said that, in that as part of that debate. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, like that's, that? that's probably not one of his better quotes because that, um, that almost seems like he's basically saying humans. Isn't that what um, you're saying, too? No. Because I, 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 the same I would stress functional equivalent, <laughs> which is which is that I don't expect them necessarily at all to be bipedal. Um, uh, you know, I don't necessarily expect them to look like us or have. Um, so you would agree with functionally equivalent organisms? Yes. You like that much better? I do like it better. Okay. Yes, but there is a niche that we have found on Earth, just as you know, kangaroos have found the hopping niche and. Um, uh, giraffes have found the big neck niche. We found a niche which is uh, modifying our environments through um, technology and um, developing more knowledge about uh, how we can interact with that environment in, in new ways, which we call science and technology. And that's right now on Earth, one species that's found that niche has... Um, been pretty successful judged by just, you know, how they've spread around the, the planet and how that, you know, there, there are criteria for success. We can argue whether that's going to last, but, but I, thought the, I thought the criteria was survival. Well, uh, you could, you could say the criteria is longevity, in which case we aren't very well proven. But if you look at, uh, you know, biomass and spreading around the planet and occupying niches that weren't previously occupied, I think there are cases to be made for right now human beings are a successful species in some regards. It, certainly, it's, an, it's a phenomenon that uh, it, it is a niche that has, um, th that has by, by some not outlandish criteria, succeeded right now for one species. And therefore, from that sort of perspective, biologically, one can ask if that niche might be filled elsewhere. Uh, and 
we don't know. Uh, but it strikes me as potentially a direction that life could continue to evolve in and, uh, and actually find some very stable, it, it could be an innovation that could, that, could, that could last in a way that other innovations haven't. And that, this is as yet unproven, but is related to maybe you know, this cosmism and a vision for the future of what this could be, that minds creating technology and becoming more aware of how that technology actually affects its world. And I would say we're in an early stage of this, um, but that awareness could potentially lead to great stability and longevity. An obvious example is um, the, the um, common phrase, at least common in our line of works, that the dinosaurs didn't stick around because they didn't have a space program. So one could imagine a species that's gotten its act together technologically to the point where it's no longer um, recklessly perturbing its planet's climate. It's gotten a handle on that. It's found energy systems that don't wreck its natural systems that it depends upon. It's learned to uh, see dangerous asteroids and comets coming so that the, uh, the biosphere that it inhabits is not in danger of that extinction um, threat. It's, made, it's ultimately learned to prevent ice ages and um, things like that so that uh, its biosphere doesn't have to worry about that extinction threat, which is something that would come along, you know, it will come along on Earth again if we don't do something about it or some, something, somebody doesn't. Well, why would the biosphere, you don't worry about your hair or your fingernails, so why would the biosphere worry about us? Oh, um, the biosphere, you, you, you does the biosphere, biosphere worry? You know, I said, what in the heck does that mean? The biosphere uh, doesn't worry about having Yeah, it. yeah, I, I'm not sure. If a few I'd species have to, die off from a biosphere. I'd have to rewind and see how I use that <laughs> phrase, but what, what I mean is that, um, <coughs> The, 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 you know, the biosphere doesn't worry about anything except to the um, extent that we are part of the biosphere. Well, it's just like your fingers. And, and we worry and about stuff. Just... I worry about lots of things. <laughs> and so, therefore, I would say the biosphere worries about those things. <laughs> but, but, but my point is, one can imagine what we are becoming something that, is in the, that uses the qualities we have to achieve a very long-lived, stable, successful state um, that could last um, cosmologically interesting lifetimes. And, um, and that, that possibility interests me, that we could be at some possible gateway, which will not necessarily go one way or the other, but one could imagine that there is, is a direction it could go in, just as life has been through other gateways, the origin of life, the origin of multicellular life, the rise of oxygen. You know, there are these certain times in Earth history where th something happened that enabled other things to happen. And I see, um, and this again may seem to you horribly grandiose, but I see what's happening on Earth now with this um, so-called civilization we've constructed and the, this wrestling we're doing with our own global um, efficacy. Uh, we haven't got a handle on ourselves yet. We're like a baby looking at its hands and going, whoa, and not, you know, we have these powers, we haven't got control of them. But, but I could see that being a gateway to one direction to becoming something, uh, a new kind of uh, interaction between a biosphere and its planet that, that would be very stable where, where those, those cognitive processes become part of the functioning of the biosphere. I could also see us not succeeding and just dying off quite easily. So I see us potentially at this gateway, but I don't see any guarantee that we're going to make, make it through. But, but just the acknowledgement of that, that potential gateway to me um, motivates my curiosity about whether there are others in the universe who have some of these functionally equivalent uh, properties and what might have happened or could happen with those other, um, you know, those other runs of the same experiment. Okay. I, what, what, you're, what you just described reminds me of uh, Beyond Freedom and Dignity by B.F. Skinner in which he's creating a community based on positive reinforcement in which the, and it sounds like, oh, that's a great way to, you know, have things controlled. But then I said, well, who's controlling the controllers? Mm -hmm. And when you gave the example of the baby with their hands and said, oh, haven't yet figured out how to control them. For me, the whole idea of control seems to be an illusion that I'm not convinced of really exists. 
It's well, that, like that baby can't the, play the piano, though, and, that, well, and uh, they can grow uh, up and they might be a concert pianist. <laughs> well, or the environment has produced a concert pianist rather yeah. than the baby doing yeah. it. The, the whole yeah. idea, I don't argue with what is happening, but I argue with the interpretation of it as a control. And it, uh, uh, that's free will. That means, for me, matter of fact, I gave it an, a, a, a lecture to a bunch of skeptics, and I accused them of being theists. I said, they've taken the God, and they said, oh, those God, those biblical God, oh, they're baloney. But what they did is put it inside their head. Mm -hmm. And each one of them has a little God, which is like a humanist who's deciding things and controlling. And I said, well, that is as theistic and then, you know, as bad as saying there's a big guy with a beard in the sky for me. And they put it in their head. And so that's why I hear every, you know, not just you, but almost everybody I hear has this what I consider an illusion. So I'm trying to so deal you're with this. So you're arguing now with just the notion of... Control, um, self, of, of, free will. Uh, free will. Yes, free will, yeah. control, yeah. self, and stewardship, for example. I think, yeah. you know what, I, you, I don't know if you've read so Susan but, Blackmore. So, Have you read the Susan Blackmore? We've got a bunch yeah. of memes in her yeah. head that are essentially, vroom, 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 they're evolving but, faster but than we me, can. Let me, let me ask you this, Go ahead. and this is not like a rhetorical or sophist question. I actually, I want to know the answer. Um, what's the alternative? view. The alternative is A produces, causes B, B causes C, and C causes A. So instead of a hierarchical pyramid, here's a God up on top of it, or myself here, and then everything else beneath it, is, hey, things going around, and things are but, happening. But how does that help? Uh, I mean, do you literally believe that we have no choice what we do, that we're like automatons moving no, through our no, life. I feel like I have um, choice just like you feel like I have choice. But the question is whether, you know, there's no soul inside of me saying, electron, go over there and jo join with that molecule. Now, if you didn't, if you're a reductionistic materialist like many of us are, then there is no room for a homunculus in there to decide, oh, electron, go over there. If so that's what the about, case, then there's nothing So, to, So what about responsibility? Like well, that guy, right. that, that guy uh, who, did that horrible mass murder in Orlando. I should probably come up with a less disgusting mm -hmm. um, example. But anyways, imagine some... Right. That, that person had no responsibility because they were just acting on some, you know, their electrons were doing this and that was predetermined. And, well, uh, well they, I have this argument with my wife who's a lawyer because they have a hard time because the whole law is... <laughs> I'm on her side. <laughs> what did she say? Well, well, the whole point is that you say, okay, you hold the person responsible for what they did. And I said, well, wait a minute. We know as a, I know as a data analyst that you see a community that is poor, impoverished, and prejudiced against, and what do you get? You get a higher degree of crime. And then she'll say, oh no, but each individual is, it's not deterministic, there are some good people. I said, yes, but we're talking about probabilities here. Who is the one, what is responsible for creating that environment which then produced the people that did all this horrible shit? And I say, well, blame the politician who created the, oh, the, and the, blame the society for having the prejudice, and blame whatever's creating the, and that's, if you want to have hold something responsible, I want to put the society in prison. I say to her, she says, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You can't put society in prison. But that's more or less the semi-absurd conclusions that I can But even, make. even okay, so like, let's, let's make it a little less abstract from a crime and what, what ultimately is the cause, which I think you and your wife both have interesting good I would say ultimately, there. see, I'm but, not looking for, it's going around the circle, there yeah. is no ultimate cause. But even right? just like, I'm, I'm, you know, walking down the street and there's somebody coming towards me and um, I don't get out of the way and I, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I push him out of my way or mm -hmm. whatever, and I just, I'm a jerk. Yo, like, why were you a jerk? Because yeah. your brother was a jerk, and he thought that, oh, that's cool when you do that jerky thing, and so you thought it was good, and et cetera. Now, why does your brother think that? Because maybe your father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A, B, C, A. But don't you still have to come back to, um, you're st it still sounds to me like that argument ultimately results in nobody's responsible for their actions. Well, yeah, yeah. So, things, a, is a tree responsible for its actions? Is a dog responsible? They talk about putting pigs in jail, for example. Hey, the pig ate the dead person. Anyway, you know what? We should probably not go into free will. Right. Okay. I, let's I, ask, I, let's I, a, over a beer, I'd love to go, <laughs> keep, keep going on, on this okay. one with you. But What's your favorite solution to the Fermi's Paradox? My favorite solution to the Fermi Paradox is that we don't know what we're talking about. I actually think the Fermi paradox is, is uh, only a paradox if we worship our brains in some godlike way. <laughs> oh, now you're preaching to the choir. Hey, preach to the choir here. <laughs> because uh, it's a paradox if we have really made some valid observation that there is no one out there, and therefore, because there should be someone out there, there's a problem. But 
but we haven't. We, you know, in 1959, uh, Kokoni and Morrison wrote this really clever paper saying, here's how you communicate with aliens. And then here we are 60 or whatever years later, 70 years later, and um, haven't found any. And so uh, we're saying, oh, there's no aliens. But really, maybe, uh, maybe those aliens don't read nature. And they didn't get that issue with uh, Kokoni and Morrison's paper. And maybe that is not really how you do it. Or maybe they have no interest in doing it. Um, I, think that, I think the conclusion that there's a paradox uh, gives us way too much credit for having figured something out. Um, and we have, we have nearly looked and hard enough to say that. Yeah, the there's, the, it, it, it presupposes a lack of signal um, where I don't know if we really know how to look for a signal that may or may not so be So signals there. may be all around, it's just we haven't recognized it, so it's, so it's our problem, not the universe. I, th I tend to think it's our problem, but further, if I'm allowed to mention what is another possible solution, um, I'm also of the mind that it's quite possible that they have no interest in us. Like if we did, even if we assume that they're out there and communicating with one another, it's also sort of self-aggrandizing to assume that they would want to try to communicate with us. And there's the well-worn, but I think good example of, you know, I can walk out in my backyard and do I sit down and try to have a conversation with some insects that are walking past and, and no I don't I, I can't imagine that I would be able to or um, that they would have something to say you inadvertently that, murder them I might I might uh, uh, I, I would hope not but um, I, I have been guilty of, of stepping on bugs um, so I just think that it's the, the notion that we know enough to definitively say that we've looked and haven't found a communication and therefore they're not there and furthermore to assume that they would be trying to communicate or interested in communicating with someone like us if they are there both of those seem um, sort of self-aggrandizing and so I just think that um, well, nothing our, wrong with self-aggrandizing <laughs> no I love self-aggrandizing no but 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 I just think that um, our Ignorance dwarfs our knowledge, and therefore it's still a, valid, a very valid question of um, whether there might be somebody out there and whether we might be able to det detect their presence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more fond now of, of wanting to try to detect their presence in ways that doesn't presuppose that they are trying to communicate with us. I see. How about, um, do you think that we're a part of an alien? For example, you know, you have neurons, 100 billion neurons. Those neurons don't necessarily know that they're a part of your brain. And she could ask the question, what would a neuron have to do in order to figure out it was part of a brain, a larger system? So let's hypothesize that we are part of an alien. And what would we do <laughs> to find out that we were part of an alien? That's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I do think, and maybe this, I think this does relate to what you're asking. I do think there's a way in which we're part of a, uh, a mind that... Uh, we're not aware of larger mind, which is that I think the collective human actions of a society and even what is now becoming a sort of global society as, as uh, incoherent and fractious as it is, does function as a mind in some ways and in fact is a mind. I mean, what is a mind? Um, you know, another long tangent question, but, but it, it seems, uh, you know, to the extent that we think our minds are um, manifested by the functioning of our brains, it seems to um, be a complex interaction of lots of um, small um, pieces that can exchange information but are not themselves aware that they are in a brain, like our neurons, I, I, like you said, don't know that we're in a brain. Well, we are um, all exchanging information in various ways and with more and more different kinds of systems and more and more connectivity around the planet. And uh, by analogy, I think that it's possible that we are functioning in some ways as a mind in, in some collective uh, that we may not be aware of as individuals. Now, would that be an alien? Um, <laughs> in the sense of if alien means extraterrestrial, uh, I would say probably not. But, but it, it does, um, I suppose, leave an opening for... Uh, something that you are kind of hinting at that what what if we were in some ways connected with some other kind of larger mind and 
would have would we have any concept of that? I'm not sure how such a thing would have come about. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, well, how about the other side? Maybe could the aliens be nano aliens? Could there be mm. you know nano aliens all over the place we just don't know about them because every time we see an unidentified object in a micro, uh, electron microscope, we say a dust or yeah, crap, I don't understand. Absolutely, uh, we have all of these uh, blinders and prejudices and. Um, ways in which we perceive the universe that are uh, self-referential, some of which we've become pretty aware of historically uh, in, our, you know, in our new cosmological models where the Earth isn't the center of everything, and, uh, uh, and some of which we probably uh, have not become aware of yet. And one of those is that we are probably biased towards um, thinking that phenomena are most interesting when they're on a scale that we can relate to. And or, have, or have sex with exactly, or eat, or you know, all these eating and sex. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to that. So anything we can't eat or mate with, uh, we probably have uh, ignored um, for good reasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But the rest of the universe uh, may, it could operate on different scales, and it's especially when you see trends in um, our uh, technology going towards nano this and nano that, one could imagine other societies that have gone in that direction to the point where they could be all around us and uh, they e either manifest in ways that we completely uh, are not aware of or we're aware of them and they seem like uh, annoying, uh, unimportant noise to us. So to, to quote Feynman again, there's lots of room at the bottom even for aliens. <laughs> yes. What kind of aliens would you like to find? You know, just turn off your rational part of your brain. Just to act as a music musician or an emotional yeah. person, and just forget about rationality. And just emo tune into your ninety-seven percent of your brain that's emotional, and ask what what kind do you want to find? Well, I mean, I have two 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 answers. One is that finding any life beyond Earth that was genuinely alien not some microbe that we took to Mars and said, oh look, a microbe we took to Mars. That would be interesting too, but some, something that really um, was a creature that um, was innately uh, from another place. That would just blow me away and it would thrill me and it would just make me feel like I had lived at a time when something important was learned and, and that, that changed what we know. I mean, I feel that way about some other things that have happened during my life, like exoplanets. I, 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 I'm, I just think it's really cool to live during the generation that discovered the exoplanets. And it, it would feel like that, but even more so to me. But I guess if, to answer your question, if I can, you know, just, just fantasize, um, somebody to talk to that we could actually compare notes with, and I'm not saying, I mean, I think it would be valuable to find any evidence of somebody out there, that even if we couldn't compare notes with them, that were doing interesting things on all kinds of different levels. But, but my ultimate fantasy is, uh, is uh, you know, somebody that we could say, hey, did, did you notice that too? You know, logarithmic spirals? Like, uh, do, you, do, do your math books have, you know, the same equations as ours? Do you, do you guys have music? Well, that sounds rather uh, what do you, academic. What do you feel from <laughs> the survival? I mean, when Sagan said, you know, there's no hope or no no sign of others that can save us from ourselves, that was more of that's appealing to our sense of existential angst about whether we continue to survive or not. And so that was a call out for a yes. Can you save us from ourselves? But you just your answer wasn't like that. Your answer was, no. I just want to talk to somebody. I mean, honestly, I think the two are closely connected. Because I think that anybody out there who has what I will call these functionally equivalent qualities to what human beings bring to the, bring to the table here on Earth, um, if we somehow ever make contact with them, they will have been around much longer than we've been around so far for mathematical arguments that you're familiar with, and um, I, I won't repeat here, but it's just the time scale arguments are likely that they've been around a lot longer. So I do think that they would, number one, be an existence proof that one can get through the stage that we're at now, where we're sort of, I think, a very early stage of confronting our nature as uh, creatures with planet-changing technology, um, and that there is a way to, to survive with those qualities. 
and get maybe to that other kinds of future that I was fantasizing about a few minutes ago where those, those capacities are used in the service of long-term survival, not a threat to it. So I think that that sort of existence proof notion is, is valuable. Um, even if we couldn't exchange a lot of information with them. But yeah, the idea that they could actually give us some hints, like how do you do this? How do you live with the kind of knowledge and technology that can change worlds um, and yet not sort of do yourself in, but, but, uh, but, but learn to sort of handle those powers? Maybe, maybe they would have some, some hints for us about that. So there's that side of it, but then there's honestly just the pure curiosity um, these assumptions we make about the universe, um, ultimately, I mean, I'm a scientist, I believe in science, I'm a, um, some kind of a uh, materialist, um, you know, I believe in these sort of platonic um, notions that there is some kind of truth out there that we're approaching in some weird way, um, but there is this, this uh, annoying possibility that it's all sort of an illusion and we're convincing ourselves that we've learned things that we really haven't and that there's a uh, that, that more of our what we think we figured out about the universe is human constructed than we like to admit but if there really are aliens out there who've done science and investigated the universe have they discovered the same things do they have the same math and the same it, it, would our periodic table make would their periodic, periodic table make sense to us uh, are we on to something, or is this all an illusion? I feel like being able to compare notes with somebody, somebody who we have in common the whole universe, but we have nothing else in common in terms of our history, being able to compare notes with them about what they've, what they've learned, what they've concluded, uh, would be really fascinating. And then there's all these other questions. I, and I really do wonder about music and what it is and how it seems so deeply innate. Um, I was going to say in all human cultures, but even deeper than that. Um, and I, I just, I'd be curious if they have something like that. Is that something that minds do, um, or art, or, yeah. So um, I guess I do fantasize about the possibility of someday making contact with some life form that could, um, that we could have that kind of conversation with. I honestly don't expect that in my lifetime. I do expect that, I wouldn't say expect, but I, I think it's possible that in my lifetime we'll find pretty good evidence of life on another planet, which would rock my boat in a, in a pretty major way. Um, one reason I, I left America is because I felt clo culturally claustrophobic. And, uh, and Harriet Tubman, they asked her, how many... How many uh, slaves did you sell, save? And she said, uh, I saved about a thousand, but I could have saved a thousand more if they had known that they were slaves. And the idea there is uh, it's important to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I'm attracted to looking for aliens is because, hey, I'm going to recontextualize, you know, I'm going to find out who I am by leaving who I, where I came from. Yeah. So finding out that I was American when I left America, et cetera. And so I guess we can find out I guess I'm hoping that we will find ourselves when we find other things. Do you agree with that then? Absolutely. Is that part of your motivation? Yes, to? yes, absolutely. Um, I, there, there are so many ways that we um, see the universe through lenses and binders and filters that we, are, we can't be aware of. And when you get away from home, you, you see things in a new way. And when you meet um, others with different experiences and... Uh, different histories, you see things in a new way. And for, for, for me personally, and for us as a as a species, uh, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be incredibly enlightening in all kinds of ways we can speculate on, and then a whole bunch more that we don't have a clue about for us to um, learn about, and maybe even exchange information with with aliens. Hey. 
you are familiar with Carl Sagan, but also with Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. Now, you remind me more of Carl than of Lynn, because Carl would talk about this universe. We're aware for the universe to become aware. I've never heard Lynn say anything remotely approaching it. She just loved her single cell eukaryotes so much that that was her, yeah. kind of like her children. Yeah. And she would be very reluctant to use the word that you used about five times in this discussion. That was the word stage. Right. And so I've never heard her use that word yeah. stage. And so uh, can you defend this use, or you just want to say? Well, I, 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 first let me acknowledge that what you said is true. I mean, I, I, I was um, uh, influenced by Lynn, and uh, she was a friend of mine, and, and I'm a fan of hers and sort of in awe of her uh, intellect and her um, ideas, and I think her work was very important. And I also um, think I fundamentally agree with her worldview about the earth and about about Gaia and that there, there are organismic qualities of the global biosphere that are important and are not captured in the you know looking at individual organisms as as complete units um, and it's also true that Lynn um, really didn't like any language that said that there was anything special about human beings she would always say uh, you know it's the microbes, stupid. <laughs> the microbes run this planet, and they were here long before us, and they'll be here long after we're gone, and the microbes are really doing everything. And, and there's a truth to that. There's even a truth to it's, you know, the microbes are doing everything that we do, because what are we? We're really, we're really right. just organized microbes uh, walking around and, you know, doing things and having conversations. So I, um, I agree with her with that truth, and yet I also... Um, disagree with her uh, in um, that, well, not to recapitulate what I was saying earlier, I do think that there is an interesting stage happening to the evolution of the planet now that is manifested right now in what human beings are doing. Um, and to me, that's undeniable. Um, the atmosphere is changing, the land surfaces are changing, the hydrological cycles, very different. Well, I think what, Lynn and myself would not deny that there are right. changes. What, yeah. what we're denying or feeling very uncomfortable with is the word stage or level or higher organism or lower mm -hmm. organism, mm -hmm. some kind of directionality. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and you don't see that as as big a problem. No, I guess I don't. I, I, guess, I guess I don't. I guess I'm a little bit more um, of a human exceptionalist than um, you or Lynn. But, I, but I, I, I was very fond of Lynn, and I'm very fond of you, even though I don't agree with you completely about this point. Okay. All right. Now, uh, is there anything else? Now, this is an interview for a bunch of students who aren't astrobiologists. They're kind of anybody, right? So they're university students and almost anybody else. It's going to be free online. So do you have any advice for them about how to think about this question? We've talked about a lot of deep concepts, but do you have any like, more easy to follow, less philosophical advice about them, or even more philosophical advice about how, how to help the man is on the this, street. Is, is your, so your audience is uh, probably not people that are going to be astrobiologists. They're most, online mostly. students that say, hey, that They're, sounds interesting. Are we alone? I'm interested. I like that. That's weird. Let's think about that for a while. Yeah. Um, so do I have any advice for them about how to think about this stuff? How about, I know you think you saw a UFO. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> is that advice that you give out regularly? or? Um, let me think if I give out any of. Uh, I'm sure I do. Let me just have a sip of coffee here and think about it for a second. I guess one thing I would say is that it's always okay to ask, how do we know that? when a scientist tells you something and it's never a bad question and in fact some of the time when you ask that question you'll be exposing the fact that we don't really know that so as much as you're learning material from experts this is a field where we're really pushing the boundaries of what we know and making all kinds of leaps so it's always good to question that's a that's a part of the scientific process and in a field like this where we're we can't help but be extrapolating to a lot of unknown territory from what we hope is safely known territory it's always good and valuable to stop and say wait a minute 
Do we really know that and how do we know it? 